College football nerds here to talk 2019 Texas A&M Aggies. This is our preview for you guys. Obviously, I got Josh in tow. We're going to get nerdy with y'all. want to remind you, if you haven't already, since you haven't maybe watched us in a while, we've put out some off-season content, hit that subscribe button for us. We know you like what we're doing, so just I'll wait. Yeah, you've, you've probably hit it by now. Okay, um, so we're going to talk. Texas A&M, but we have done some other off-season content. We're trying to do previews for as many of these big teams as we can. We also had an off-season series that we're kind of in the middle of that we're discussing the worst referee calls that we can remember in the modern era that had postseason impact. Check it out because I think y'all like some of that. So, okay, Josh, let's talk A&M football. Um, this is – we're now getting into um, – experience time with Jimbo Fisher at A&M. It's not just the new face at coach, at quarterback, at whatever. It's it's him sort of tenured there now. We we kind of don't know what to expect from this them this year given how hard the schedule is. We're going to talk about that later. But just to kick this discussion off, um tell me with this team this year what do you like about Texas A&M? What gives you some confidence about this team coming into the 2019 season? The positive for Texas A&M, by no question, is the fact that they return most of their offensive production. Kellen Mond is a good receiver. I think he, like Felipe Franks, is a much more talented receiver um, than he's even really been able to show to this point. And he, as he gets more consistent, and he was a lot more consistent at the end of the season, particularly the LSU game and the North Carolina State game, he can hit a much higher ceiling than he's been able to hit to this point. The receiving core returns Osmond and Davis. It can returns Rogers. It actually has some depth to it. The offensive line only loses one starter. You do lose uh, Trayvon Williams. I, I don't, you know, but Joshua Corbin is a very explosive player. I'm not sure necessarily if he has, you know, the kind of impactful all around guy that Trayvon Williams is. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops. We're not necessarily the experts to talk about that, frankly. But I do think the offense is the key, you know, the, obviously the strength for the team. They were 19th in the country in scoring offense despite playing a lot of really good defenses last year. Um, 15th in the country in total yardage, which was kind of impressive. Um, I, I think it's interesting that their passing actually went from uh, 251 yards a game to 252 from 2017 to 2018. Um, and they were 255 yards a game in 2016. So the, the passing yardage per game hasn't really changed. The difference is that the rushing production went from 155 yards to 220 uh, from 2018 to 2019. And I think even though they lose the, the running back in Williams, the return of the offensive line, granted, last in the conference in sacks, it, it does at least speak to the fact that the offensive line is probably going to be better than they were a year ago. So you think most of those numbers are only going to improve. So I know you've been in the past a pretty – big cheerleader for Jimbo and you thought that this was a good hire. I did too. Um, would you put him so far in the positive? Um, or would you say there's still question marks there with him specifically at Texas A&M? I certainly include Jimbo Fisher to be one of the positives for the team. And I think he's a very good coach. There's always been a lot of chatter with him when he lost Florida, left Florida state. Right. And a lot of the stuff in the off season, a couple articles, a couple other things have been blaming Jimbo Fisher for things that went wrong. I'm going to be clear with my opinion. I, I think Fisher did leave some things that were sort of unsettled. I think he the offensive line situation has to be somewhat pinned on Jimbo Fisher. But at the same time, I think a lot of stuff from the Florida State camp is excusing what the current coaching staff at Florida State has been able to do with the talent that they have on the roster, and they do have talent on that roster. Um, DeAndre Francois was there when Jimbo Fisher was there, and he was a hell of a lot more successful under Fisher than he was with Taggart. Um, the offensive line wasn't necessarily that much better a few years ago either. Um, I think the bigger issue is the administration has invested in Taggart, and they're going to say that that was the right investment, one. And two, Texas A&M, uh, their resources for the coaching staff are a lot better. Jimbo Fisher was frustrated at Florida State with the fact that he couldn't hire the assistants he wanted to hire. Their facilities are okay at Florida State, but they're not elite. Uh, Texas A&M is able to give him elite resources, and most importantly – and I think you would agree with this, that neither one of us, frankly, thinks, for example, Ed Orgeron is the greatest individual coach in the country. That's correct. But what Ed Orgeron has been able to do is just is to assemble what is, I think, either the largest or second largest support staff, Alabama being the other one in the country. And they do that by paying a lot of people, by having a lot of office space. It costs a lot of money to do this. It costs tens of millions. 
Fisher is getting those same resources at Texas A&M. And for any amount of disorganization he had at Florida State, I don't think that's going to play out at Texas A&M because at Texas A&M, he's going to have the resources to bring in all these other guys to help make sure they have, and I think it's underrated, right? Do you have a meal plan? Do you have a training regimen for every player? Do you know what their injury history is for every player so that you can track these things and have them work on the right exercises in the offseason? Are you tracking their weight on a regular basis? Are you tracking their academic schedule? Do you make sure they have the right tutors? All this stuff that helps make the programs like Alabama and LSU what they are, I think Fisher wasn't really able to do that because of resources at Florida State. I think he's going to be able to do that at Texas A&M, and that's what's going to make him be successful at Texas A&M. And I think we're probably going to start to see those dividends really this year and moving forward. So I think there's been a lot of discussion this year coming into this season about this just murderous schedule that A&M has. And I think A&M and South Carolina probably have two of the hardest schedules that I've ever seen. Um, and you know, yes, it's the preseason and we don't know, maybe Auburn is bad. Maybe Ole Miss is good. We don't, they're not going to be good, but you know, there's a lot we don't know. Um, I have two questions for you here. One, do you feel like there's a high possibility that Texas A&M is a nine is a 10 and two team? that's presenting with a with an eight and four record at the end of the year just because of the schedule and two is there a possibility that hidden in this tough schedule are some breaks that might get them a better record than we maybe will project now given that they have clemson sandwiched between texas texas state and lamar then they have auburn then they have Arkansas, which is a week off. Then they have Alabama. Then they have Ole Misses, which is a week off. So there's a, until you get to that last stretch at UGA, at LSU, there is a gap between every tough game where you have a week off or a bye week. Could that maybe be some light at the end of the tunnel for Texas A&M this year? I don't think there's any doubt the schedule at Texas A&M is a major challenge. And, uh, you know, you can look at different schedule, strength of schedule rankings and how high they are, in my view, um, I personally would say that it has to be the hardest schedule in the country. I think it's kind of comical. We just did a, a show where we were, appear, a, uh, we were appearing on a Bucknuts podcast with Kyle Lamb, and we commented on how FBI strength of schedule rankings are kind of broken right now. Texas A&M, for example, is 11th in those rankings, which is comical. Um, as we said on that show, uh, it's because they look at how hard your average opponent is, okay? So I am going somewhere with this. When ESPN looks at strength of schedule, or Sagarin is another example, the, the ranking is actually determined about how hard it is to make a bowl. And you make a bowl based off your six easiest games. The problem for AM is they want to do a little more than just make a bowl game. And that's determined not by your six easiest games, but by your six hardest ones. It's almost unfathomable to have a schedule where your six hardest games include Clemson, Alabama, Georgia, and LSU. Uh, and then on top of that, you still have the rest of the SEC West slate, including Auburn, Mississippi State, and you get South Carolina out of the East, which, you know, maybe is the third, arguably maybe the third best team in the East this year outside of Florida. So if you pick a schedule to be as difficult as possible, it's hard to do a whole hell of a lot worse than AM has in front of them. What's the reality out of that? It, again, FBI, again, their strength of schedule rankings may be bunk, but I think their at least power rankings have some merit. Clemson's number one, Alabama's number two, Georgia's number three, LSU's number four. Um, personally, I'm quite high on LSU. We're both very high in Georgia. Texas A&M could be, our, conceptually, the fifth best team in the country, legitimately. Only lose to teams that are better than them and go eight and four. And that's insane for a team that, again, fifth best team in the country could justifiably go 8-4 and four with this schedule. I think if Texas A&M is a top 15 team with this schedule, all they have to do is drop one of Auburn or South Carolina, lose the other four games against top five teams, and you're looking at 7-5. and five. If they had a schedule, like let's say they flipped and they had Clemson's schedule, Texas A&M is quite possibly a 10 or an 11 win team. But with the schedule that A&M has to face, they suddenly become an, a seven or eight win team. It, it's going to be brutal. 
it's going to be massively unfair. The one thing I can say is I think A&M is good enough to surprise somebody and beat them. And college football is a highly variable sport. Even when teams, let's say a top five team plays a top 15 team or a top 20 team, Vegas would generally tell you that it's only about a 65, 70% chance that the number five team wins. When Auburn played Georgia twice in the same season, you saw wildly different results than the two times they played. It's really common in football. The ball bounces different ways. Teams have a good day or a bad day a lot. We talk about a lot that as much as we do predictions, that it's still a highly variable sport. So Texas A&M could, you know, quite easily win one of these games. But, you know, the problem is the schedule and the difficulty of it. And I, I don't think there's any more difficult stretch than playing South Carolina, Georgia, and LSU all in a row at the end of the year. It's going to make winning in either of the Georgia or LSU game extremely difficult. Um, likewise, uh, Alabama, Ole Miss, and Mississippi State are all in a row, which means you play a, arguably the, you know, I would say most teams would be this the toughest game on the schedule, but Clemson's earlier before you have to play two others. It's going to be hard for Texas A&M to get out of those scheduling sets unscathed. At least the tough teams are broken up in that Georgia and LSU are at the very end of the schedule Alabama's in the middle, and Clemson's at week two, where there's some breaks between them. Uh, but nothing about this schedule does them any favors. And in fact, I might say this is probably the hardest schedule I can ever remember seeing, period. Honest to God. Have you seen South Carolina's schedule from this year? <laughs> because it's, South pretty, Carolina. it's pretty brutal, too, because they, they not only have the and, and I will say it's not that fair since they, they're playing another Power 5 team out of conference, but it's North Carolina who was bad last year. But their crossers are Alabama and Texas A&M. Um, they end the season with Clemson. They've got the East, which is down, but they've got Florida and at Georgia, at Missouri, in a year where I think that, and this is one of my silver linings for Texas A&M this year, in that, they went eight and four last year, but a couple of those games were against teams that I don't think are going to be as good, and that's Auburn and Mississippi State. So they get those back. I think South Carolina takes a step back. Um, they beat Kentucky, which was a big deal last year, and they trade them um, for Georgia, but they beat LSU last year. So Beating LSU isn't outside of the realm of possibility for this year. If we assume that we're not doing a Mississippi State preview, I don't think if we do, we probably wouldn't make a lot of Mississippi State fans happy because neither one of us are very high on them this year. I think they're actually going to be pretty bad. So if if somehow you can beat Clemson or Alabama, and I know that's saying a lot, um, then you could very well have only one loss on your schedule coming into Georgia LSU, drop one of those, finish with a 10 and two season with a very, you know, that'd be very satisfying in my opinion, given the, given the schedule. Well, it would be satisfying, I think to most objective fans, but I think it'd be really disappointing and frustrating in the sense that Texas A&M at that point would probably be a playoff caliber team. Right. That wouldn't make the playoff. I mean, right. if, the team, the A and M team that goes ten and two with the schedule, probably goes undefeated. Honestly, in the Pac twelve, any other <laughs> schedule, they go undefeated with any other schedule. Right. It's, I mean, it's just absurd. It, it, it truly is. And you know, we can go back and forth on, you know, who's harder. It, again, like is LSU better than Texas A and M as a part of the discussion uh, between the South Carolina schedules and the A and M schedules? But both these schedules are just psychotically Brutal. absurdly <laughs> difficult um and you know we we're always kind of big advocates when i when i compare teams and you talk about wins and losses i've always made the point that i think the fair way to do it is to say based off how you did against your schedule like how well you beat the opponents in front of you did you lose a stupid game how would this other team have done with your schedule? Right. Do you think that's a fair way to consider it? Yeah. I, I mean, and that's what I've always been frustrated with, like with preseason rankings and it is human nature, but we look at, we look at teams and we rank them based on what we think their win loss record is going to be at the end of the year, not how good we think they are. And that's where we get into situations where we have a, you know, uh, a, a discussion on whether or not 
an undefeated Oregon this year belongs in the playoffs. Well, a lot of people are going to say, well, 12 and 0, 13 and 0, absolutely, they belong in the playoffs. They're a P5 team from a P5 conference with a clean record, but they could easily go 13 and 0 without a ranked team on their schedule. And the same thing for Ohio State, where I think Ohio State's going to be really good this year. But how many SEC teams or Clemson or a handful of Big 12 teams could you put into a schedule who realistically, if Penn State doesn't takes a small step back, realistically, Ohio State will not play a ranked team this year until the very last week of the season when they play a Michigan team that got throttled by Florida last year. So I think your way is absolutely the right way to do it is to say, okay, Drop this team into somebody else's schedule. Drop somebody else into this schedule. We could have done that with Notre Dame last year as well. And, and I think that's a far better way to look at it because it's not fair. It's not the NFL. We try to do this NFL thing where where we, we, want, we want 16 teams in the, in the playoffs and all this. There's no parity in college football. And there's 130-something teams. So you have to do some subjectivity there. You can't just look at win-loss records. Right, and to sort of elaborate on that, Oregon plays Auburn, right? So you easily can have a scenario where at Texas A&M, let's say they beat Auburn by 20-plus points, and um, Auburn, let's say Oregon beats Auburn by two, and then they go 12-0. and They're going to end up in the playoffs, even though A&M was clearly better, a lot better than an Auburn team that was level with Oregon. Right. And, and it's... In that scenario, you know maybe A and M's left out because they go nine and th- let's say eight and four again, losing to Clemson, Alabama, Georgia, and LSU. We have every reason to believe that all four of those teams and A and M are all actually better than Oregon. But that's not the way it's going to work out, and, and there's a lot to it. You know, I we got in this conversation pretty hard and heavy last year with UCF because UCF had some really close, ugly games against teams that were barely ranked. And our point was, if if you do this like four times in a season against the teams that UCF was playing, there was no way they would have gone undefeated with a, you know, a, a, not just an SEC schedule, right? But, you know, if they had to play... A top 50 the, schedule. Right, a, a top 50 schedule. It just would not have happened with the level of play. You know, Clemson had... A closest game against Syracuse, but again, where the starting quarterback gets knocked out, they had a close game against A&M, who was actually a very good team, and the rest of the schedule they just beat the brakes off them. And that's what really, really good teams do, and that's why we thought Clemson was a really, really good team. Um, but yeah, you can't. So when we say that, I mean it's things like Ohio State losing a game to Purdue. If Ohio State can screw up and lose a game to Purdue, and then you know you're almost losing a game to Nebraska Maryland. or Maryland. Then if they're playing a schedule like A&M has this year, that Ohio State game you expect to drop like five games. That would have right. been my my expectation given how what the games that Ohio State did lose and how they performed in them. So we're, we're not just saying like, you know, you're not as good or as bad as your schedule. Having a weak schedule doesn't make you a weak team. Having a good schedule doesn't make you a good team. But your performance has to be evaluated against the strength of your schedule. And if you're barely winning games against a weak schedule or you're, you're almost losing games to really bad teams – um, that is an indication that if you played a harder schedule, you would have lost several more games. Um, and, and that's going to be the story with A&M because it, it would be the greatest miracle in the face of the planet and, and probably an all-time story of A&M, frankly, was to make the playoffs with the schedule they have this year. That's the hard reality they have in front of them. Um, and, and so the conversations from us all year is probably going to be kind of how good is A&M really and probably all season – how high should they really be ranked given who they lost to and who they beat and who those teams beat? And a lot of the teams, like, again, maybe Auburn beats Oregon. Oregon goes 11-1, and one, um, and a- they end up being ranked, you know, 12th in the country and A&M's unranked, uh, even though, let's say, A&M beat Oregon. That kind of stuff is going to happen this season. And it's a good, like, a perfect example is 2017 A&M versus 2018 A&M. That team lost... That gave that huge comeback away to UCLA, who wasn't a good team, to start the season, then struggled with Nickel State, then looked ugly against the Raging Cajuns in Louisiana. Um, far different team in 2018, but at the end of the regular season, there were just one, there was eight and four versus seven and five. 2018 Texas A&M would have killed 2017 Texas A&M. So, okay, so let's do this. Um, looking at this absolutely brutal schedule, 
Let's take LSU off the table because they beat LSU last year. There's no reason to think that Texas A&M wouldn't be competitive or possibly beat LSU again this year, uh, regardless of what the preseason chatter is. So let's just take these three games. At Clemson, Alabama at home, at Georgia. Um, and let's say of those three, if if Texas A&M is going to win one of those games, which one is it and why? I think to answer this question, if it's cool with you, I want to talk. Can I talk a little bit about what I think to be the weakness for Texas A&M? Sure. So I, when I look at A&M and try to break them down this year, the, the biggest thing that stands out to me that's concerning is the dichotomy between their rush defense and their pass defense from 2018. And we talked about this a lot with really A&M and Missouri both had outstanding rush defenses last year. I think Missouri's flew under the radar quite a bit, frankly. Um, But A&M's was also extremely good. I mean, they were eighth in the country in yard per carry allowed, only allowing 3.2 yards per carry. Third in the country in yards per game, or yards rushing a game, allowing 95 yards per game, less than 100 yards per game. But they were 98th in the country in passing yards per game allowed. And again, we do yard per carry statistics because some of this is volume. If you have a really good run defense, you expect the passing def- the passing yardage to be higher because teams don't try to run the ball. They try to throw it. But it isn't just that they threw it more. They were more successful per play, 8.2 yards per attempt. So that, you know, that mathematically by def- definition accounts for volume. Just per play sense, they were throwing for 8.2 yards per attempt. And that's given the fact that teams were throwing more, so AM was actually in a pass-first defense most of the time, and they still couldn't stop it. Now, what's really concerning about all that is where AM really had losses was on the defensive side of the ball, where they're kind of hitting the reset button, and they lost a tremendous amount of production in the front seven. Uh, if you look at tackles for loss for AM, they had five guys that had over 10, ta- 10 or more tackles for loss last year. Of the five, four are gone. A lot, Alaka was at 14 and a half tackles for loss. Kiki was at 11. Durham was at 10.5. And Mac was at 10. Uh, the only returning guy there is Matabuke. And Matabuke was at 10 and a half, which is really, really good. But uh, again, like when you're looking at that level, those were all top 25 in the conference in tackles for loss. Five of the top 25, tw- uh, a full 20% of the top units in the SEC was all in AM's roster. It was phenomenally disruptive. And to lose that kind of production, and again, it, it continues on. Like the next guy on the list is Caper Smith at eight. Uh, Dotson was next at seven. All of a sudden, you're all the way down to Buddy Johnson, who had five tackles for loss, half the production of any of the six guys that were ahead of him that they lost from a season ago. So I can't see Texas A&M replicating their eighth in the country yard per carry defense, third in the country overall rush defense numbers from a year ago. I think it's really telling that maybe they'll make some steps forward in the past defense category, uh, because uh, even though you know a lot of those guys return, they're basically all being passed in the depth chart. I always see that as a very, very good thing. Uh, a, a sign of a unit that's improving isn't really so much returning starters in my my view. That means you're going to be a little better than last year. The sign of a truly improving unit is when returning starters are passed on the depth chart. That's a sign when you're actually really getting better. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, we talked a lot last year too, like Renfro and Oliver were massive liabilities. They're unlikely to start. They've got a junior college transfer. They've got uh, Miles Jones who came on late in the season. I think they're going to turn things around. But regardless... A&M's weakness was pass defense, and I can't quite get past that. I don't think that their run defense is going to be good enough to be able to completely hold in the pass, but regardless, I think they're going to give up a lot of points this upcoming season. I don't think the defense is going to be great. So the teams they need to be able to beat are teams that are pretty good or okay at running the ball, not necessarily great passing the ball such that they can score a lot, and teams that they can outscore. On that list, the obvious one to me is LSU. Georgia and Alabama have top-shelf quarterbacks on the roster. Clemson has a top-shelf quarterback on the roster. Those three teams should be able to pass the ball for significant yardage against Texas A&M, unless I'm surprised. The team that does not have a top-shelf passing attack is LSU. I don't, 
you know, they're going to take some step forwards, at least theoretically, but they're still not on the same level as those other three teams. Now, Georgia, Georgia may be a little screwy. We don't know what the wide receiver situation is yet, so I may end up eating crow on this. But LSU, last year, a lot of people, mis- you know, underestimate the fact that they were in, I think, like 45th in the country in rushing, actually. They were not very good, at, particularly good at running the ball. Um, they could pass the ball well enough to be effective, but not at a super high level. What I could see that LSU game turning into is a game where um, – at the end of the season, they get in a little bit of a track meet again with A&M, and they can lose a game for similar reasons as they did last year. Um, again, you said to throw that aside. So what's the next one? The next one is probably the Georgia game. Uh, again, I think Alabama is probably a little too productive through the air. Clemson's a little too productive through the air. The Georgia game is another winnable game because without the receivers, I think Georgia's passing offense may not be necessarily super explosive. Georgia is going to run the ball pretty well. But I think maybe AM can hold up against the run. They're going to get pushed around a bit. And, and, and it, that, that's going to be kind of the story, I think, is how well is the AM defense going to hold up? A lot of new faces late in the year, they're going to be better. Um, and you're going to do well, better against teams uh, that run the ball than teams that pass it. You know, for me, I think that all of that makes sense. Um, I, I like that, that we talked about these games in isolation for this year and didn't look back and say, okay, well, Alabama blew out Texas A&M, so that one's off the table. And Texas A&M was really close to Clemson, so maybe they beat Clemson. We don't do a lot of that. We don't look back previous years a whole lot unless we're looking at production lost. Um, so I, I like that you did that. i probably say the same thing, even though I still have – Georgia, you know, I think we both said 11-1 for Georgia in the regular season. Um, And this certainly could be the game that they drop. Um, I would probably say Georgia as well just because I I think they'll be okay at wide receiver. Pickens is going to be good, I think. Um, But I think there's just some question marks in general on that team. Uh, So that would be an opportunity. It's tough for me because – the one thing I like about the Georgia game, even more than the LSU game, is it comes before LSU. So LSU is going to be tough because it's after Georgia. They're going to be beaten up. Um, but this kind of leads into, I think, us wrapping this one up. Um, I'll go ahead and give my season prediction, and you can give me yours as well. Um, I think 8-4, and four, but I'll say this. I think 8-4, and four, but I think they win one of these big games. I think they lose a game to someone they shouldn't because of a season attrition with all of these games. Maybe it's injury related. Some other reason they're going to drop a game that they shouldn't and they're going to win a game that they maybe shouldn't as well. Uh, Tell me what you think. Yeah, I I tend to agree with you. I think eight and four is realistic. Um, It frankly, I think the sec West is going to be down a little bit in this upcoming year. And a lot of my expectation is based on that. I don't think Auburn is going to be as good as they were a year ago. Uh, I don't think Arkansas or Ole Miss is going to be able to take a step forward. I think Mississippi State is going to take a step back. And when you break down the schedule that way, Texas State, Lamar, UTSA, those are all gimme wins. I think AM is better than South Carolina. So you're already kind of starting with a baseline. If you put add Arkansas and Ole Miss to that, well, you know, at that point you're pretty much already at six wins. So it, it's not that hard to get to eight. Um, and if they drop – if they drop one of, let's say, Auburn, Mississippi State, or South Carolina, they can make it up by getting another team. And again, I do kind of agree with you. Anytime you have a team that has this much offensive output, and we've said this a lot, these teams are really, really good at beating teams they shouldn't beat, um, but maybe not as good at going undefeated. And the reason for that is one of these teams, be it Clemson, Alabama, Georgia, or LSU, is probably going to have a bad day when they play in m it's just unlikely you play all four teams and all of all four of those teams is clicking are clicking on all cylinders when they play texas a&m and because a&m can score all it's going to take is a&m having a day where they're on on a day when one of those other teams is off and a&m can beat them um it's a little bit like the old miss model from a few years ago when Ole miss punked alabama a couple years and then would lose to a middling arkansas team later in the season the whole point was Ole miss managed to beat alabama because you know, they, especially that 2015 game that was so wild where they caught a ton of breaks, you know, a guy pass tipping off the hands of one receiver to another guy, a receiver's hands, um, stuff like that. And that's what can help Texas A&M win one of these games uh, against a team that may well be a better team than them, 
but the again, the shame of it is, even if that happens, you're still looking at eight and four. So eight and four, and we talked about before that there's a very good chance that they could be a ten and two quality team with a record that doesn't show that. Could it be a situation like last year where they get into a bowl game where they're clearly better than the team they're facing just because they're going to be faced with somebody whose records line up and honestly eight and four with this schedule versus an eight and four coming out of the ACC this year or the Pac-12 this year. I, I mean, obviously I'm not calling a win now for whoever they play in a bowl. That's ridiculous. But could we see a similar situation where kind of like Auburn with Purdue last year or Texas A&M and NC State where they're far, they're a far better team than their record shows, and they get someone far inferior in the bowl game. I would go so far as to say that I expect it. That that pretty much regardless of the result, whatever A and M's record is, they're going to get paired with a bowl pairing that's not as good as they are. We talk a lot about you can take stuff from the bowls, but you you have to be very aware of how good were these teams relative to their own conference, because most of your bowl win loss rankings are just based off pairings and seeding. And usually the team that does the best in bowl season is the team that gets left out of the playoff because everybody's essentially slotted one slot down. Um, whereas, you know, when, they, when the SEC's gotten two teams into the playoff, now all of a sudden, you know, you're playing, let's say, the uh, Big Ten number one versus the SEC number three and that kind of thing. So I, I think A&M probably is going to end up with a with a being having an overmatched bowl opponent. And I'll say, I mean, if you're in the situation where A&M were to make the playoff, then even in that case, they'll probably be overmatched because that means it's an A&M team that you know beat Alabama prop two at least two out of the three or three out of the four with Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, and LSU. So it, it's pretty much a given that an A&M team going into bowl season should be in a pretty good situation regardless of what the bowl is. All right, y'all, that's our preview for Texas A&M 2019. We're going to obviously cover a lot of them this year given the monster games they have on their slate. I want to remind you, if you haven't already, hit that notification bell after you hit the subscribe button. Give us a like if you liked it. You can downvote us if you didn't. But either way, let us know in the comments what you think we will see from Texas A&M in 2019 and if you think they're going to be a better team than their record will show. Thanks so much, y'all, for sticking with us this long. Have a great week, and God bless.